Hi, today we're going to get into a bit of the groundwork for talking about how atoms are put together and how they interact. Uh, but first, before we get too far into that, I wanted to give you the chance to review something from uh, a previous lesson. The last thing we talked about was moles, so it's not quite going away yet, but it's almost out of the picture for a while. Uh, hit the pause button if you want to work through this your, your, on your own, but I'm going to get started now. Uh, using my reference tables, I don't quite know what tungsten is, but what's good is that if it's an element, most of them are on table S, and I look it up, and it tells me that the symbol for tungsten is W. So then I can go to the periodic table and look up the uh, mass of tungsten, and I'm going to round. It's uh, 184, which is the number in the upper left-hand corner when looking at that box. So for our conversion, we're going to just write our given value like usual, uh, and we're going to cancel out atoms. But we can't go straight to mass, grams, we're going to go to moles because that's the relationship that we know. And then also we're going to immediately go from moles to grams. And then we just have to fill in our dimensional analysis. I get 7.641 grams. And if we were rounding for significant figures, we'd round that to 7.6 grams because uh, we go based on our initial measurement. And uh, don't forget that the conversion factors are exact numbers, so we don't need to have that limit our answer. Uh, so for today, I actually did want to mention this paper clip again because in talking about atoms and, and atomic structure and atomic theories, a paper clip's a good example. Uh, over the course of human history, we have learned that this paper clip is made of atoms. But the question does kind of jump out at me is, how do we know that? And also, what exactly are atoms made of? This We said that this was uh, iron, how do I know that? How can I see that? And how can I actually work with iron on the macroscopic scale knowing what's on the microscopic scale? Our first model of the atom is going to come from uh, a Greek philosopher by the name of Democritus. The, uh, when talking about matter, he hypothesized that one could divide, divide a sample of matter and then take that division and then divide that sample of matter and then keep dividing that sample of matter into smaller and smaller pieces and then eventually there is a smallest particle of matter, and that smallest uh, particle of matter is a representative of that matter as a whole, as in it has all the same property. And it was named for its property of not being able to be split. The atom literally means not splittable, not divisible. Um, that's, not, that's really the only thing we're going to mention for about 2,000 plus years, but uh, not much happened in terms of science. There was a little bit of alchemy in that time, but John Dalton is the next place we stop. He is the first of a very long line of old, dead white men that unfortunately shaped much of what we know about chemistry, and they're the only ones that made it into the history books. John Dalton did a bunch of experimentation on the macroscopic scale and was able to infer things about the atomic scale based on what he found out. Uh, the tenets of what he discovered are there, but really what he did was a bunch of experiments where he weighed out specific masses of elements and compounds. He knew how these elements and compounds react, or he knew that they reacted, and then based on the masses that reacted, he was able to hypothesize something about the atomic scale. And so, like, he too built off of that idea that there are atoms, but specifically, like, if he weighed out and he said carbon and oxygen will react to make carbon dioxide, and it turns out that the uh, 12 grams of carbon would react with exactly 32 grams of oxygen. And he was able to do a lot of those controlled measurements to then figure out something about the relative masses of those atoms. It turns out that the ratio of carbon to oxygen, he said, was 1 to 1.333. The model that he came up with was one that showed atoms as these hard spheres that would bounce into each other and maybe stick together and chemically react. And that's where we uh, have been doing a lot of our particle diagrams for the last while. And it works well enough if you're just drawing particle diagrams, but it turns out that the atoms themselves are far more complex. So moving forward in science, uh, you know, as we got new information, we had to refine and revise our models. So to get us into that, I wanted to let a physics teacher talk a bit about tape. One of the really simple experiments we do when we teach a and is to demonstrate Coulomb's law and the interaction between charged particles using scotch tape, using just sticky tape put on the table. When you peel it off, it acquires some charge. 
since I'm doing a blog post about this, I thought it might be a good idea to have a, a little video that shows exactly what happens in these situations so you can see the physics I'm talking about. So the idea is you just take a piece of tape, pull, peel it off the table, and when you do that, it picks up some charge. You can tell it has picked up some charge because it's attracted to my hand once I do that, and that's a polarization force from the charged tape to my neutral hand. If I take a second piece of tape prepared the same way, these two should repel each other. And you can see that the tape bends apart like that until it gets so far apart that it starts to stick to my arm. What's more interesting, and the subject of the blog post, is to take two pieces of tape and arrange for these to be so that these are neutral. Right? This isn't attracted to my hand significantly. Uh, then when I separate these two tapes, one of them is going to end up positively charged, the other is going to end up negatively charged, and these should attract each other. Let me stop sticking to my hand. These should attract each other, uh, unlike the other ones that were pulled apart. The interesting thing about this is it's really hard to get these tapes in a place where you can see that they're attracting each other, but not have them come all the way together and collide. Um, and that's an interesting phenomenon that turns out to be kind of hard to model mathematically, and that is the subject of the blog post, that you'll have to go to uncertain terms. Uh, so interestingly, just through that short demonstration about tape, we can talk about a lot of, of science progressed, obviously, from the early 1800s. Um, and one of the big discoveries that we made was this existence and the ability to control electricity and this idea of charge. Uh, specifically, I wanted to talk a little bit about a, um, a machine that exists. It's around, uh, it's much less prevalent now, uh, but the cathode ray tube was found in earlier televisions, not uh, LCD or OLED or anything like that. Um, and it's also found in some older computer monitors if you have any of those lying around. But in general, the idea is that high voltage causes heat, which causes a beam to be shot out, and the beam can be directed uh, to draw a picture. And that picture it only happens because when the beam hits the fluorescent screen, the screen glows. Uh, and you can actually get colors to show up by putting different compounds on the screen and directing the beam to hit certain particles. But back in the early 1900s, uh, this beam was far, the technology was far less developed. And J.J. Uh, Thompson, another old dead British white guy, did a lot of experimentation with these tubes. And you can see that this tube is a lot more simple than the one on the previous page. Um, but you can also see this image that I'm sure has grabbed your eye. This is what happens with an old CRT television when you bring a strong magnet to the screen. The image distorts, it's because this beam is being distorted and pushed in, the, in a direction other than what the TV is trying to point it at. It's interfering. Thompson's cathode ray tube was a little bit simpler. So you can see it looks largely the same, but what, uh, what he did a little bit differently is this tube was evacuated largely, and there's no matter, uh, and then a, uh, a small amount of matter was put back in. You still have the coating so that you can tell when the collision happens, and, and then you still have this electricity passing from the cathode to the anode, a high amount of voltage, high amount of heat, causing this beam to show up, and this electricity passes through the hole in the anode, a little bit of a limiter, and you still get that image. But what Thompson did, he actually took it a step further, and then he put charged plates on either end of this tube. I know that's magnetism in the image, but he had a little bit con more control over electricity. And then he charged this plate with a negative charge. We knew what negative charge was. We weren't 100% sure what it was made of. And we knew that positive charge was a thing, much like you saw with the tape. Positive and negative attract, two positives and two negatives repel. Um, and then in this tube, the, uh, the charged plates caused the beam to bend. And that was the most important, um, the most important discovery he made. The degree of bending actually was variable with the amount of charge that was put on the plates. And so what's kind of nice is we had a way to measure how much charge something had. Then you can look at how much the beam was bent. And so there were t a bunch of interesting conclusions that came out of this experiment. First, we knew that the beam was negatively charged 
and had a really low mass. Well, he didn't actually know anything about the mass. He actually discovered something called, uh, 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 close to it, called a mass to charge ratio. He was able to determine based on the fact that this was mostly a vacuum, that the, uh, the beam somehow came out of the matter. The beam was made up of something in the matter. It, and that kind of means that the, uh, the matter that's in there, well, it has these particles inside them. Whatever these negative charged particles are, uh, are inside the atom. So parts of atoms exist. So what, that's, that's the super important part about this, this conclusion. This demonstration shows that atoms are divisible. Uh, it, it turns out that Thomson was not really able to discover much more about these negative particles until he worked with another uh, scientist, Milliken, and several others, uh, conducted an oil drop experiment, which I don't really need to talk about here, but basically through the oil drop experiment, he was able to figure out the amount of charge. And so if you have the mass to charge ratio and then you have the amount of charge, you can put the two together and figure out the mass too. Uh, and so we were able to figure out uh, two things by putting this together, that, the, um, that there are these negative particles and they are less massive than the atom. That, that's because we had an idea about how much the atoms themselves weighed from previous work like Dalton and others. Um, and so in general, he, was, he put all this information together and he said, look, these atoms exist. We thought they were indivisible hard spheres. They're not. They have negative particles inside them, but when I touch matter, I don't get an electric shock. So if there's these negative particles inside this atom, there has to be a positive to balance it out. And him being British, um, he came up with this idea of like, that kind of sounds like this thing called plum pudding. Uh, Putting to them does not necessarily mean putting to a lot of us. And so I like to think of it as a chocolate chip cookie, where the cookies are the electrons, they're negatively charged, and then the rest of the cookie just has a generic positive charge associated with it, such that everything ends up neutral. Um, this way, when a high amount of energy or heat is pushed onto this atom, you know, one of the electrons will pop right out, go along its way, and that that beam that was bending was made of electrons. Um, that said, that's a nice model. Obviously, we know it's not the model that we're using today for the atom based on anything else you've seen in anywhere. But we knew this was an improvement for the time and this was all he had to go on with the information he had. So what is the cookie made of? It might stand to reason that if there's a negatively charged particle, which is what the electron was, it's just a negatively charged low mass particle in an atom, um, there probably would be a positive charge, but he had no data to actually back that up. Um, so in general, we've talked about two different uh, models of the atom. An early one where based on experimentation, we just were able to figure out that these particles, these tiny particles called atoms existed. Um, and then Thompson, through his work was able to refine that model, probably refuting some parts, but also you know failing to refute others. You, usually it's not that like disagreement occurs. I mean, yes, things change, but also at the same time, it's more like putting a, a clearer lens on and getting a better picture of how things actually exist. Thanks for watching.